Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? We're so glad everybody's here with us this morning. We want to take a couple of minutes and just share with you a couple of quick things. We want to welcome, first of all, all of our family that's watching, and uh, we're so glad that you're uh, with us this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, uh, text someone and tell someone uh, about what's uh, about to happen because Holy Spirit's about to happen. Let me tell you what. Um, so we're super excited about church this morning. We hope you are as well. We want to take also take a, a special time right now and just welcome our first-time guests who are with us, maybe for the first time watching with us. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to join in with us, and, and we pray that you're blessed this morning. Um, we realize that we're not meeting uh, in church in person and live, uh, but we also are super excited that we have this amazing technology. Uh, and so if you're looking for a home church, if you haven't been able to find one, we'd encourage you to maybe consider Living Word Fellowship, uh, your home church. If you go to a home church, then, you know, thanks for hanging out with us this morning, but uh, be a blessing to your, your home church. But if you're here for the first time, we'd encourage you to text the word welcome to 559 559- 550-5290. It's up on your screen. Just text the word welcome and we'd be uh, so grateful and we want to be uh, in communication with you. Uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, download the church app if you already haven't done that. LWF Dinuba on the App Store or the Google Play Store. Uh, in order to receive all of our news and announcements, uh, text the word news to that same number, 559-550-5290. I see that people have been doing that every week. Uh, that gets you up to date with all of our announcements, what's happening, uh, and all of that uh, sort of thing. So we just encourage you to do that. Uh, this morning, if you're on your computer or if you're on the app, uh, join in with the chat with us. Last week, we were blown up on the chat, and it was so exciting uh, to be able to see people super excited about what God is doing and uh, all that God wants to do during the service. Submit your prayer request. There's a place there to uh, uh, request prayer and uh, see what uh, uh, we can do for you in prayer and agree with you in prayer. Uh, so invite somebody to watch with us. And also, if you don't mind, tell us where you're watching from. If it's Dinuba, cool. If it's Reedley, awesome. If it's uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. If it's all the way back east, go for it. We'd love for you uh, to be able to uh, tell us where uh, you're watching from. Speaking about watching, this coming Tuesday, uh, July the 28th from 7 to 10 p.m., that's 7 to 10 p.m., we are hosting a live online prayer meeting uh, with Callie Ship Gray. And uh, if you would like to be a part of that, you need to register. Uh, and you can go to tiny.cc forward slash prayer invasion. Uh, it's up on your screen. Uh, go to that website. Uh, you'll be able to register there. And once you get done registering, they'll send you a link uh, that will link you to the live stream. Uh, she is actually going to be here in the sanctuary. She's praying on the ground here in Dinuba. We're super excited uh, to have her here. Uh, I just registered this morning because I realized I forgot. So if you forgot to register, go ahead and just take a couple of minutes and go right to there. You'll see the listing of all the different cities that she's going to be traveling in. And uh, the first one is Dinuba for this week. Uh, so go ahead and be sure uh, to do that. Uh, at this time, we're going to have our pastor come up. Uh, he's going to be doing offering. Uh, we're so excited about what God wants to do here at Living Word Fellowship. And we're just praying that God is going to continue. Amen. God is going to continue to move despite our circumstances. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mark. Hey, good morning, everybody. Are you ready to sow your seed? Amen. Amen. Those over there watching from home. Uh, and from various places, we want to encourage you in your giving this morning. Up on the screen, you're going to see various ways that you can give electronically. For those of you that are still uh, uh, needing to write checks or what have you, of course, you can drop those in the mail to us, or you can come by the church office, and we are open Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 4.30. You can drop it off at that time. I want to encourage you this thought this morning. It occurred to me that your life is in your seed. And when you're sowing your seed, it appears as if you are burying that seed. But the Bible says, Jesus said, the seed has to fall to the ground and die. In other words, what happens is this. When you're sowing your seed, you are dying to the ability of that seed to eat it or to have any fruit from it 
in the natural realm. In other words, it's not going in your checkbook, in your account anymore. It is coming out of that and being planted and sown into the kingdom of God. But the cool thing is this. When you sow your seed, it dies to you, but God breathes on that seed, and that seed comes to life, and it bears more fruit than you could ever imagine. The Bible says that as long as the earth remains, there will be seed, time, and harvest. From the moment you sow your seed, it is alive in the ground. And God is breathing on that, and God is watering that seed. And there's a period of time when you sow seed, you don't go out in the backyard, and, and if you sowed into a garden, expect the next day for there to be tomatoes on the plant. No, it takes time. And as you're sowing, then there is sowing, there is seed, there is time, and then glory to God, the harvest comes. And where people mess up is this. During the in-between time, because they couldn't wave a magic wand and see the fruit of their seed, they quit sowing. They quit sowing. And so here's what happens. You have this seed that you planted, you have time, and then you have harvest. And so they sowed their seed, they've gone through this time, and now they harvest what they sowed, but the problem is, while they were waiting in that time for the seed to produce, they quit sowing because they said, the enemy lied to them and said, this is not working, this is not helping, there's nothing coming. And so now they reap for a little while from the former seed, but then there's another gap. And I'll tell you, I just want to keep on sowing every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. I want to keep sowing because I want a continual harvest to come in to my family. And so as you're sowing your seed today, be consistent, be faithful, be generous, and watch what the Lord will do. Well, this morning we are going to make our declaration over our seed. This is the year of declaration, and when you speak, you are speaking life. You are speaking life into that seed. You are speaking life into what you have sown into the kingdom of God. So join me there on your screen, and let's make these declarations together. This is my seed. I sow it from a heart of love and faith. I joyfully release this seed with clean hands and a pure heart of obedience. It will do what you say it will do. It will produce what you say it will produce. It will become what you say it will become. This seed will further the kingdom when released into your hands. Because I'm a tither and a giver, the windows of heaven are open to me. And you are pouring out a blessing so great, there is not enough room to contain it. You will rebuke the devourer for my sake. He cannot destroy the fruit of my ground, and the nations of the world will call me blessed. With this seed, my finances are free from the spirit of mammon. I walk under the umbrella of your blessing. I receive your blessing. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing in my household. I declare this in agreement with your word, and I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise in sowing your seed today. Hallelujah. How many of you know God loves a joyful giver? That is your heart and your passion is in your giving. And the scripture goes on and says, and such a person that is joyful in their giving, I will not do without them. God can't wait to join in with your giving. Well, speaking of joining in, join in with us this morning as we enter into the presence of God. Even there in your living rooms, come on, stand with us and let's go into the presence of God. I tell you, when you sing, you breathe 
in, as a matter of fact, all the hubbub about COVID-19 is, is that you can't sing or you can't speak out because when you do and when you shout, then things come out of your mouth and the particles come out of your mouth into the airways. But I want to he- I'm here to tell you that the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise him. So if you are breathing, and I find it interesting that the very nature of COVID-19 is to take our breath away and to cause a shortness of breath. Uh, uh, Charles Floyd, when he was passing away, the very last thing he said on this earth was, I can't breathe. And it is the picture of the knee of the enemy trying to take out our breath and take out our life. But I'm here to tell you, I'm breathing. And if I'm breathing, I'm going to praise him. Come on and join me today. And let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Time moves in rhythm with his song. Moment by moment, beat by beat. Rolling through death, bolt kick and snap. No rebel beat out skips his feet. And it might sound wild. But who on earth says our song should be tamed? And now the music chases hard Mercy by mercy, no by no We lost the pitch, he moved the score Our wayward notes a sweet resort And it might sound wild Some hopeful dying dream Watch it wind up just as he said And when it does we'll sing uh, Like we wish we'd known the shit back then Yeah, it might sound wild But we don't have to wait till then Sing it Let it glorify, magnify your name. 
Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you.
Hallelujah. 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 I want you right there where you're at to turn your faith on and to turn on your expectation. Not just for the word that I have to bring this morning, but for what's about to happen in the next 60 seconds in your living room, wherever you're watching from. We sang it when the Lord walks into the room, sickness leaves, despair leaves, death turns to life. And I don't know what's died in your life. Maybe it's a hope, maybe it's a dream, maybe it's a job. Maybe it's an anticipation and and an expectancy that you had at the first of the year. None of us saw coming what came across the United States of America. But I am here to tell you, in the words of A.W. Tozer, Jesus is still on the throne and none of it's caught him by surprise. And the same God that sits high and looks low He cares about the affairs of this life. And he is about to walk into the room where you're at. So if you're sick in your body, the Bible says lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Well, you have hands, put them on your sick body. And right now you're gonna recover. Healing is coming from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet right now. Right now, right now, right now. Right now, right now, everything in between. The Lord is healing you, touching you in your body. If you've got problems in your money, I want you to pull out your checkbook. Pull out something that represents your accounts. And I want you to lay hands on that right now. And I speak healing to it in the name of Jesus jobs where there are no jobs, promotion where the company is cutting back. You see, my friend, when you are a believer, watch this, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. That means the world has no jurisdiction over you. Isaac sowed into the land of famine, and the same year while everybody else was starving, and dying and there was famine and God gave him increase and I just declared over you you are not subject to what the enemy says and what's going on around you you are not subject to the stock market you are not subject to Wall Street or Main Street or the bank accounts or anything else you are only subject to what he says and what he says is I would above all things that you prosper and be in health. Oh, God loves you. God wants to bless you. God's about to walk into the room in the power of his spirit and healing and virtue is leaving him and entering into your room. Right now, right now, your living room is becoming a sanctuary to host the presence of God as he steps into the room. Come on, worship him with us. Worship him with us. Hallelujah. Make this words the declaration of your heart and believe it right now. Believe it right now. Hallelujah. When you walk into the room, sickness starts to vanish. Every hopeless situation to exist when you walk into the room dead begins to rise cause there is resurrection life in all you do we love you we'll never stop
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, right now as we bring the word, I thank you it does not return void. It accomplishes the matter for which you send it forth. They spoke of Jesus, and they said, he doesn't talk like average men do. He speaks as one having authority. Lord, I thank you that the reason is because he was the word speaking the word. And now the word lives and abides on the inside of us. You said, if I abide in you and you abide in me, you can ask what you will and it will be done and nothing will be impossible to you. And so, Lord, I declare your word doesn't return void. I send it forth to heal, to deliver, to set your people free, free from fear and anxiety and worry and concern, free from any hindrance of the enemy, free from any sickness or disease, free from poverty, free from waste and ruin. God, I send forth your word right now to deliver, but I also send it forth right now to encourage, to edify, to build up, to strengthen the body of Christ today. Wherever they're at, hearing this word, we thank you, God, that it does not fall on deaf ears, but it falls on good ground. It falls on good ground. And Father, that we're ready to receive your word, the incorruptible seed. And God, we can do what your word says we can do. We can have what your word says we can have. And we can be everything your word says that we can be. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. There in your living room, give the Lord a praise right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Well, I tell you, uh, a few of you tune in for the worship, and then you tune me out. And I don't know what's up with that, because I got something to say, so you need to stay tuned right now to this word. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, special strength for your assignment. Special strength. Not just strength, but special strength for your assignment. Last Sunday, we spoke to you out of the book of 1 Kings chapter 18, the story of Elijah. And all the way through 1 Kings chapter 18, God speaks to Elijah. He calls forth a drought and a famine because Israel had turned away and turned their hearts toward the idols of Baal. We have an evil king, Ahab, and an even more evil queen, Jezebel. You've all heard that term about Jezi or Jezebel, and this is where it originates from. There was a spirit over her that was evil and wicked. And she was out to destroy any of the prophets of God, anything that represented God or or had any sort of resemblance of God. If the word of the Lord came through a prophet, she wanted that prophet killed. And there is a Jezebel spirit in the land today that's trying to shut up the mouth of the word of the Lord. But I'm here to tell you we are freely going to declare the word of the Lord. And I hope Jezebel starts screaming and crying and and wringing her hands because I'm telling you that spirit is going to be broken. That spirit is going to be broken in Jesus' name. But Elijah goes and he fights against and he speaks out against all the idols of Baal. He speaks out against the prophets of Baal. There were 450 prophets of Baal. He calls them to the mountaintop and he says, if God is God, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. And so he calls on the prophets of Baal and he says, go out and give it your best. And they're out there cutting themselves and they're out there screaming and hollering and begging and pleading all day long. And Baal doesn't show up and consume the sacrifice. 
And then he says, are you guys about done? And he goes out and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take and dig trenches around the, the altar. And he says, and I want you to cover all the altar and all the wood and cover the sacrifice with water. Just drench it good. And then he says, and fill up all the trenches on top of it. So they go and they do it, and he calls down and he said, God, you are the God that answers by fire. And God comes out of the sky, and the glory of God sets upon that altar and sets upon that sacrifice, and, it lap, and the power of God laps up all the water and consumes the sacrifice, and all the people of God are turning to God now, the people of Israel are turning to God and away from the idols of Baal. And shortly thereafter, Elijah calls for it to rain again. Now that the people's hearts are back to God, then he says the drought is over. I think it's symbolic of what needs to happen today. I believe that when the hearts of God's people are turned back to God and away from the things of the world and away from the idols and the things we've put our trust in and we start putting our trust and our faith back in the Lord, I believe God's going to consume our lives as a living sacrifice and all of a sudden the drought and all the pain and all the famine and all the things that have been going on in the United States of America are suddenly going to lift and it's going to rain with the glory of God and it's going to rain with revival, hallelujah. And it's time for that. And so we pick up that story where we left off last Sunday, and it says this, Elijah said to his servant, or excuse me, Elijah said to Ahab, the king, go up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed up to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed low to the ground. And he prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked and then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. So seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Somebody say, look again. Last Sunday I talked to you about that. We kind of left off with that. That whatever you've been looking for, sometimes you got to look again. It wasn't, there was no cloud, there was no sign of rain the first time, the second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. But the seventh time, there was a cloud the size of a man's hand. <clears throat> we talked about the fact is, is that sometimes it doesn't happen as quickly as you'd like to. But as we said earlier about your seed, there's time in between. But it's the heart that we have when we're looking. What are you looking for? Are you looking for doom and gloom? Are you looking for the things to get worse? They're saying that the pandemic's going to get worse before it gets better. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. They're saying there's another wave of crash that's coming to the stock market and on and on and on. And I'm here to tell you, if that's what you're looking for, that's what you're going to find but if you're looking for the presence of God, if you're looking for the cloud, if you're looking for the rain, if you're looking for God to show up, he will show up in the midst of your mess. Amen? Then he said to his servant, go and look. He did that seven times. Finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Oh, then Elijah shouted. He didn't speak to him. He shouted, hurry and go and tell Ahab, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. Soon the sky was black with clouds and a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm. And Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength. I want to turn your focus to those words. The Lord gave special strength to Elijah. 
He tucked his coat into his belt and he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. If we're not careful, we look all the way through the 18th chapter and we see all these wonderful things that Elijah did and that God used him in and we miss the very last verse. We can see him defeating the prophets of Baal. We can see him calling on the drought. We can see him calling on the rain. We can see all these wonderful, miraculous things and the great miracles that he performed. But if we're not careful, we'll miss something. And I don't want to miss anything God's got for us. He says here at the end that the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. Elijah got special strength from the Lord. I want you right there where you're at. I want you to think about this, and I want you to say those words with me. Special strength. Say it again. Special strength. Say it a third time. Special strength. He ran faster than the king's chariot. Now, I want you to get your mind around this. I'm trying to set you a foundation so that we can get into how this is relevant to where we live today and what God is about to do in our lives. Amen? I want you to understand this. He ran faster than the king's chariot, not just any chariot, the king's chariot. It was widely known that the king had the best of all the chariots in all the armed forces. In everything that Israel had, the king had the best. He lived in the best home, in the palace. He had the best of food when they brought it to him. He, he, he rode in the best of the chariots with the best drivers, and listen to me, the best horses. It was the fastest, it was the most elite. Now the Bible does not bear this out, necessarily, but I imagine in my mind uh, um, Elijah coming and running along, and here you have Ahab, and he is, he is taking off in his chariot, and about the time he's ch- taking off, he sees Elijah running beside him, and he looks over, and he says, what do you think you're doing? And Elijah said, I'm running to Jezreel. Can't catch this. And he says, Elijah, you're crazy. Don't you know I got the best chariot, the fastest horses, the best driver? This chariot won the J.D. Power Chariot of the Year Award. Have you lost your mind? You can't outrun a chariot. You see, a man could only run at full speed about half the speed of a chariot under the power of a horse. And then on top of that, a man can only last at full speed maybe 100 yards. You've seen races. You've seen the various uh, track meets. And you know, it's easy to run as fast as you can for a 50-yard dash or maybe even a 100-yard dash. But when you get into the quarter mile, the half mile, the mile, and certainly into a marathon, how many of you know the man has to slow down and pace himself or he will not be able to last the endurance of the race and he'll run out of steam. And the fact is, is that we could parallel this situation to a great race where Elijah is here and he is into his own strength and his own ability, and he's going against something that defies all odds, there's no way. It is impossible for him to even keep up with the chariot, much less, watch this, go 20 miles. How many of you know that's a marathon when you're running it? 20 miles. I couldn't run 20 yards right about now. But I'm here to tell you that with special strength, It came upon Elijah, and he did what was humanly impossible. The Bible says that he runs to Jezreel. Jezreel is important because that's where, and I want you to get the spiritual significance of this. Remember, 
Elijah's assignment was to turn the hearts of Israel back to God and to not allow their confidence to be in the wrong thing. They had put their confidence in Baal, and they had also put their confidence in their leadership in Ahab and Jezebel. And so it's very, very important that you understand not only the, what the race was and what the odds were against Elijah, but in addition to it, where they were going to. They were going to Jezreel. Jezreel was the self-proclaimed capital now of Israel. It was not Jerusalem at this time. Ahab and Jezebel had set up Jezreel as their capital. They had built a huge tower that could see miles and miles out in every direction so that they would know if the enemy was coming to try to attack Jezreel. They were fortified with walls. And in addition to this, Ahab had built Jezebel this beautiful, amazing, overwhelming, gaudy palace. So they had this huge palace. They had huge walls. They had a huge tower. And on top of that, this also, watch this, became the capital where they uh, manufactured and they showed off the fleet of the chariots that Ahab had built. Ahab had built all these chariots and he had, if you would today, we would liken it unto a factory that was just putting out the chariots. And you can imagine, you go by a car lot and you see when a car lot is packed full, they, they line up all their cars. They line it up out there for, on display for everybody that passes by to see it. And, and they drive by in hopes that maybe someday they look over and they say, oh man, I need a new car, and they'll pull onto the lot. Well, it was kind of the same thing in Jezreel because they would line up all of the chariots, the whole fleet of chariots, and what Ahab was trying to put into the people's mind was this. You need to trust in these chariots. You need to trust in us. You need to trust in our strength. You need to trust in our power. You need to trust in our ability. You need to put your trust in the chariots. But the Bible says in Psalms 20, verse number 7, some trust and boast in chariots. Some trust and boast in horses. But we will trust and boast in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. It is significant that God gives Elijah special strength and that the race was to Jezreel and that he outrun a chariot. Why? Because when he got to Jezreel, the people that were in Jezreel could see he had outrun a chariot, and I could just see it right now. He's sitting there at the gate, and he's looking at his watch, and he's saying, where in the world is Ahab? Ho-hum, been waiting here a while. And then people are coming and saying, where'd you come from? Oh, I just came from Mount Carmel. Really? That's 20 miles away. Yeah, I outran Ahab. He'll be along any time now. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And in comes Ahab, rushing through to the finish line. And he looks over, thinking for sure that somewhere along the line, he outran and passed up Elijah. But no, there's Elijah sitting at the gate and saying, it's about time, what took you so long? Oh, I know, you were trusting in a chariot. I trusted in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, God wants to give you special strength today to outrun impossible situations. I just want to know, chariots represent power and speed and ability to dominate with force. So what is it in your life right now that seems so much bigger than you can handle? that seems so far beyond your ability to overcome. How huge is that opposition that you are facing? 
Well, I got a good word for you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 29 says this. God gives strength to the weary, and he increases the power of the weak. God's given you strength today. It's strength to outlast. God's given some of you strength to try again. You say, I'm depleted, I'm wiped out, I don't have any strength, I can't run anymore, I don't even want to try this anymore. I'm here to tell you, he's going to give you special strength so you can try again. He's going to give you special strength so that you can get back in the fight and fight the good fight of faith. He's going to give you special strength so that you can step up to a whole new level. God is giving you special strength. You know, uh, I look back over my life, and there have been many, many times that I could go back and I could recount the times where God gave me special strength. Shoot, even right now, right now after overcoming COVID-19, and here I am. And they said that just last week would have been my normal time to just be coming off oxygen. And shoot, I've been off oxygen for months now. Hallelujah. They told me that I wouldn't be preaching until the end of September, but we ain't even through July yet, and I was preaching on Father's Day. And, and you see, it's not by my might, it's not by my power, it's special strength that comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. I look back over my life, and there have been many times in even the 23 years that I've been here in Dinuba, there have been so many times I remember when the Lord spoke to me and told me prophetically that I would become the mayor of the city and I would lead my city in the fight against Sacramento, the fight in Washington, D.C. to represent the people of Dinuba, lifelong politicians in red tape. And I thought to myself, Lord, I have no experience in this. I have no ability in this. You surely got the wrong guy. I, have, I don't even want to do it. How many of you, God's ever asked you to do something and you didn't want to do it? Amen. You know, God spoke to Joe, uh, jo, uh, what's his name? Jonah. That's his name. God spoke to Jonah to go to Nineveh and he didn't want to go. And I didn't want to do this. But God gave me special strength getting this very building that I'm preaching from today. Do you know it was a 10-year journey to get in this building? 10 years. And there were many times along the way that my strength ran out, my will ran out, my endurance ran out. I didn't even want to fight anymore. I just wanted to throw in the towel and just reside over on Nebraska in that small little building. And I just needed some special strength. I remember with the opposition of all the banks and the people of our community, many of the people in our community were fighting against us to get this building. Most of you all know the story behind that. And without going into it, there were voices, even former council members, even, even former mayors of this city that were speaking out against us. And because I could not speak to the city council at that time, because I'd been on the city council, and then I had, got, I had come off, and there is a law that says that I can't sway anybody at, for two years, and I can't even speak on behalf of myself or anybody in the community to sway the direction and the decision of a council for two solid years. And we found ourselves in that battle against people that were speaking against us. And yet there I sat in what felt like a courtroom in those wonderful chambers that I had once presided over as the mayor. And now I sat there and couldn't even speak and defend our great church. Yeah, God's called me to do some things that seemed impossible. Fifty banks had turned us down. Fifty banks in getting a loan. It was in the height of the recession. Most of you remember, the odds were against us. It was impossible. And I look back over that time of my life, and folks, 
I needed special strength. I was weary. I was tired. It had been 10 years, 10 long years of fighting that battle. I thought it was going to be easy, and in six months, surely, God will supernaturally provide for us. But it wasn't that way. It was a prolonged period of time. And whenever uh, there's a prolonged period of time, the Bible says hope deferred makes makes the heart sick. And time after time, my hope would be crushed, and I needed some special strength during those times. And then most recently, defeating covid Uh, When I was in the hospital and I was weak and weary and ready to give up and just go home and actually saying, Lord, just take me home. Just take me home. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm weary. I have no strength left in me. I'd lost 35 pounds, and, and physically all of my body muscle was gone, and, and I was down and depleted and being fed through a tube, and I was just tired. I was weary, and I, I said, you know, I don't want to even want to fight this anymore. Just take me home. Has anybody ever been weak? Has anybody ever fought, and you needed some special strength from the Lord? Well, in each and every case, I'm here to tell you, special strength not only was needed, but special strength came. I said special strength came. You see, when I faced Sacramento and when I faced Washington, D.C., I did so in confidence and in the favor of God. I still remember walking in to the United States congressman's office and saying, we've got to have this road widened. We've got to have road 80 and and 416. We've got to have these roads widened. We've got to have Alta and El Monte widened. It's got to happen. And they said, no, there's no way. This was back during the Bush presidency. And as you know, our congressman is a Republican, and he was trying to side with party lines at that point and say, we're not going to have any, any uh, earmarks or anything in this and, and the funding that's there. And I said to him, I looked him in the eyes, and I said, how many people have to die on that road before you care? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was the vice mayor at the time, and the mayor is hitting me on the knee and saying, shh, 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 you'll tick him off. No, it moved his heart. It moved his heart to find a way around, and the United States uh, um, uh, federal government gave a, a, a million dollars towards this, and then the county brought in a million And the city brought in a million. And that combination between the three opened the doorway for us to move from number 32 and number 33 in the order of widening of roads to number one and number two. I'm telling you, God will give you special strength to do what is humanly impossible. In the eight years that I had the privilege of serving on the city council, our city council was fantastic. We had an amazing city manager, and there was more done in that eight years than any time in our 100-year history. All the buildup in the community, our police force went up by 50%. Our wages went up. The prosperity and the blessing of the city went up. A new water tower went in. Best Buy Distribution doubled their their plant that's here and and increased by almost a 1,000 new jobs over and over and over again in this small town. God's blessing was upon it because he gave me and he gave our council special strength. Many on our council weren't even believers. But I tell you, when you're called to lead, he will also give those around you that you are leading with special strength, even when they are not necessarily believers. Oh, he's called us to impact the world. When 50 banks said no, God gave me special strength day by day until we heard yes. I said, until we heard yes. That day that Daryl Nicholson walked in to this building and he said yes. And there was financing provided when 50 banks in the middle of a recession had said no 
and some were like, heck no, there's no way. There's no way possible. We don't even want to look at it. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter who says no if God says yes. I said it doesn't matter who says no if God says yes. And so what you've got to do is you've got to lean in on that special strength of the Lord and know that he is awesome and he is not, his hand is not shortened toward us. When the doctor said there's no hope, my body had shut down and even my will to fight was gone. But he sent an angel into my room to minister to me and to prophesy night after night after night until the will to live came back in and the will to fight came back in and I was able to say when the devil came as an angel of light and said, I'm here to take you home. I'm here to to let you go ahead and die tonight. I knew it was not the voice of the Lord because it was contrary. Even though it sounded good, it sounded like light, it sounded like life, and it sounded like a wonderful, sweet, tender voice. The devil doesn't come to you all the time in a harsh voice and say, I'm going to take you out. No, sometimes he comes as the angel of light and he says, I'm going to let you go home to heaven. I'm going to let you go ahead and die prematurely. Tonight's the night I'm going to take you. But the Lord had given me strength through the angel that had strengthened me and prophesied and declared the word of the Lord and lay in there on my bed with the tube out of my mouth and still on the ventilator, I heard myself up out of my spirit say, No, devil, I'm not done. Hallelujah. He'll give you special strength. The verse we stood on, while I was in the hospital, my son came up with this, my wife came up with it, and it was all over the t-shirts that said, I'm not done. And it was 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 17. It says this, the Lord stood with me, and watch this, and he gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. I'm here to tell you, the Lord will give you special strength today. So there's about four quick things I want to share with you. I want you to get this and get this down in your spirit. First of all is this. We don't like to hear this, but it's the truth. We all get tired. And we all get weary sometimes. Everybody does. Now, I know some of y'all think you're Superman or Wonder Woman. And that you're never going to wear out. But even Superman had kryptonite. Come on, somebody. And I'm here to tell you there will be a time, no matter how anointed, no matter how commissioned, no matter how great your assignment is in life, there will definitely come a time and you will run out of strength and you will be weary. Moses got tired. Israel was out fighting the battle. And as long as Moses' arms were raised, they were winning. But Moses got weary, and his arms started going down. And when his arms went down, because his strength was gone, and he was weary. The great Moses, the deliverer of Israel, that stretched forth his rod and parted the sea, that struck and water came out of the rock. The great Moses, who had his arms raised in victory. Sometimes you've had your arms raised and you're praising God, but in the midst of this, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of all of the longevity of this thing, we thought this was going to last for a couple of weeks, or then we thought maybe a couple of months, and now here we are all these months into it, and some of you, your arms are getting tired, your arms are getting weary. I'm telling you, God's going to give you special strength and send Aaron and her and lift your arms up when you can't. He's going to lift up your arms and lift up your head because there's still a battle to be fought. Yeah, Moses got tired. We just read about Elijah. Elijah was no doubt very tired in the midst of this. He just had three and a half years of drought. 
And then in addition to this, later on we read that, Moses, or that Elijah, after he came into Jezreel, Jezebel was on the loose and said, I'm going to have you killed. And he went and he ran out under a tree and he prayed and he said, God, just let me die. I have no strength left in me. And God brought him special strength in that moment. God brought him special strength. Shoot, if you think you're not going to get weary, I remind you Jesus got weary when he was carrying the cross and he was walking up the hill of Golgotha. He fell under that load because he was wiped out. He had lost his strength. And God came and ministered to him through somebody else that carried the cross the rest of the journey for him. Yes, even Jesus got weary at times. Remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed and he said this. He said, Lord God, if there is any way, let this cup pass from me. And the Bible says, I believe it's in the book of Luke, that that night God sent an angel to strengthen him and give him special strength for the journey that lay ahead. Yeah, Paul got weary. Paul got weary in well-doing. Paul was, was struggling. He was in prison. He was in bonds. He was in chains. And even the great apostle Paul got weary. So if you think, friend, that you're going to go all the way through life and you're never going to run out of strength and you're never going to get weary, I'm here to tell you, you are human. You are human and you will get weary. And it is human to be weary and without strength at times when all hell is breaking loose. I always struggled with this passage that the Apostle Paul talked about. When he said this, his strength, God's strength, is made perfect in my weakness. And I always hated that verse. How can you hate a verse like that? But I did, and I'll tell you why. Because in my personality, I look at it that we, and, and we tend to look at weakness as something that we want to walk away from and we want to appear strong. And especially in leadership and even, even just guys, we just say, look, I want to be strong and I want to lead my family and I, and, and, and I don't want to appear weak and I, you know, and, and I don't want to look weak. And everything is built around our appearance so many times. Women do the same thing. Nobody wants to be weak or without strength. And there were so many times that I looked and I said, God, it almost looks like you're encouraging us through this verse to be weak in order that your strength would come. And I always looked at it from God's strength to me. And I never looked at it, watch this, as God's strength through me. And so I looked at weakness and I looked at, at weariness as something to be walked away from and to, and to shun and say, no, no, no. And I never quoted that verse, but I want to show you this today. In the, book, in the, in the Amplified Bible, it says it this way. God says, my strength and power show themselves most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will gladly glory in my weakness that the strength and power of Christ may rest or, listen to this, pitch his tent over and dwell upon me. For the sake of Christ, I am well pleased to take pleasure in inabilities. I take pleasure in insults and hardships and persecutions and perplexities and distresses. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am truly powerful in divine strength. And then I read it, and I want you to see this today out of the Message Bible. I love the way the Message Bible says it. Because when I was in the hospital, this is what happened to me. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. Mm. 
I quit focusing on the handicap, the thing that made me weak or the thing that, that, that appeared as if I didn't have strength and I was weary. I quit focusing on the lack or the handicap and I began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. I love it. It's the picture of God's strength invading your weakness, invading all of your weariness. And he says, I invaded that. Christ's strength moved in on my weakness. Now I take limitations in stride. I just take it all in stride and with good cheer. These limitations that kept me down to size, abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks, COVID, losing my job, struggling, not being able to pay the bills, the weakness, the attack. The thing that I lose strength in, he said, watch this, with good cheer, these limitations don't just cut me down, but now I just have chosen to lean in and let Christ take over. Let him take over. So when I am weak in human strength, then I am truly powerful in divine strength. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Second thing I want to point out to you is this. We all got to run the race. Not only do we all get weary and lose our strength at times, but it, uh, at the end of the day, I just got to tell you, everybody's got to run your race. Everybody's got to run the race. Elijah was not transported to Jezreel. God did not say to Elijah, well, you don't have to run the race. I'll just beam you up, Scotty. And yet we see that there were times when Elijah would be whisked away because when he said to go tell the, the king to his servant and to this other man, he said, he said I don't want to go tell the king you're here because the Spirit of God keeps moving you. And every time the king shows up where you were, that he's out to kill you. And every time the king shows up, you're gone. And the Spirit of God has whisked you away. Shoot, we even see that Elijah never died. God sent his own chariot and caught him up in a chariot of fire into heaven. So God could have done it that way. But in this instance... I believe that the Lord did this on purpose. And the reason that he did it was not only all the spiritual reasons, but I believe he did it for you here today so that you would know we've all got to run the race. We all have to run this race. Wouldn't it be great if you could just whisk me away, Lord, and take me to another place? How many of you have ever said that? Oh, I just want to disappear from everybody and everything. When we went down uh, to Southern California and we, we went down and we enjoyed the beach and we enjoyed the resort for a little over a week down there and I looked at Tammy and I said, oh, it's so wonderful. I'm going to escape the heat. Y'all were suffering with 102 and 103 degrees and I was down there in Carlsbad and I was enjoying 75 and sunshine, baby. Ooh, it was wonderful and God whisked me away from this place. And sometimes we look at it and we say, God, just whisk me away. I just wish I could disappear and you could take me out. Has anybody ever felt that way besides me? God, just take me away. Get me off of the merry-go-round. I just want to go away. No, you still got to run your race. I said, you still got to run your race. You, you can't escape the race you're in. It's the race of life. We want the pandemic to just lift and go away, and maybe someday it will, but I'm here to tell you, until it goes, we just have to run the race through it. Let him give you special strength. Don't pray, God, just whisk me away. I just want it to all go away. No. 
God wants you to walk on water. God wants you to keep your eyes on him and your focus on him. Peter, you got to get out of the boat and you got to walk that journey. Elijah, you still have to run the race that is set before you. He's going to give you special strength for it. Third thing is this. Sometimes we all need special strength. Not just strength, but special strength for the journey. You know, the Amplified Bible says it this way. It says, the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. The hand of the Lord was upon Elijah. And I love it because the hand in the, in the Hebrew, it is the picture of the open hand indicating, watch this, the power, the strength, the means, the direction of God. And so that's why he tells us to lay hands on the sick and they will recover because the open hand means and it indicates the power and the strength and the means and the direction and the healing, the anointing of God himself. And so the Bible says the hand of the Lord, not the fist, not the arm. It says his hand was upon him. And oh, I'm here to tell you, it also says the Lord. And the word the Lord is Jehovah, the self-existent or the eternal one. In other words, God doesn't need anybody or anything. He is God all by himself. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, hallelujah. He is God all by himself. He can do anything he wants to do. He can say anything he wants to say. And he can be anything he wants to be. And I'm here to tell you, God will be in the midst of your mess if you will invite him in. And I'm here to tell you, Elijah that day, he received the hand of the self-existent one. He received the hand of the eternal God. I love it when it says Jehovah God and it uses him by name there and says the Lord because he's eternal. In other words, whatever you're dealing with, it'll pass. It'll pass. It came to pass. And someday all that you're going through will pass. But it will pass a lot quicker and a lot easier if you let the eternal one put his hand upon you and give you special strength, just like Elijah did. Also, putting the hand upon is a, is a universal sign in the scripture of God's stamp of approval. When he says, the hand of the Lord is upon you, it shows God's approval. I, I remember in the Bible, in uh, Second Kings, Elisha goes and he tells the king, I want you to shoot an arrow. And Elisha is about to die. And the king says, oh, Elisha, I don't want you to go anywhere. And he says, come on over to the window with me. Open the window. And he said, pull back the bow and get ready to launch the arrow. And as he is pulling back the bow, the Bible says Elisha put his hand upon his hand on the bow and helped him and pulled it back and launched it. And there are many, many times that I go along, and I don't know about you, but I need the hand of the Lord upon me. I need the hand of the Lord upon me. And when I feel the hand of the Lord upon me, it is so wonderful because in the midst of it, it doesn't matter who's against me. Because if God before me, if his hand is upon me, if his hand is guiding the bow and the arrow, then it doesn't matter who's against me. For if God is for me, who can be against me? And I can do anything through Christ who, watch this, strengthens me. I'm talking about the strength and the power of the Lord. Sometimes we need that special strength. Special strength is supernatural, uncommon. It's the touch of the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, as I go in around third and head home on this, I want you to know this. Special strength is coming your way. Special strength is coming your way. You know, Elijah had made a practice of this. 
He received special strength when the ravens fed him at the brook. And then when the brook dried up, he got special strength from an uncommon source in a widow woman who only had a little bit of meal and a couple of sticks and was about to fix a cake for her and her son, and then they were going to die in the famine. But she made the man of God the cake first. She sought first the kingdom. She put the kingdom of God first over her own needs. And whenever she did, God brought special strength. And the Bible says that that meal, they lived off of it for the rest of the famine, that it just kept replenishing. I'm talking about special strength and uncommon things. Over and over and over again, Elijah had put his faith and his trust in the special strength of God. Fourth and finally, we need special strength to accomplish what God has called us to do. You see, God's got a destiny and a purpose for every one of you. Every person under the sound of my voice, you must listen to me. You are not just put on this planet to go through life, to live, to enjoy, and to go through things, raise a family, and then die. No, 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 no. My friend, a thousand times no. God has a special purpose for each and every one of you. You were made with purpose. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That means God made you special. And he's got something special for you to accomplish in your life. And we all need God's special strength to accomplish the special thing that God has called us to. Remember this. Elijah had a special anointing on his life and a special assignment to draw Israel back to God. And so God gave him special strength for the special assignment that he had. The task and the assignment will always be more than what you can humanly accomplish. Why? Because it demonstrates God's glory. You see, if it was all about you and the task and the accomplishment that God had called you to was all about you, then you wouldn't need his glory. But God says, I won't share my glory with anybody. In other words, don't think it's all about you, pal. Don't think it's all you that got you here. I remember a famous Christian artist. And I won't say who it was. It was many, many years ago in the 80s. And they were on a uh, talk show. And they asked him, they asked this artist, what do you attribute your success to? What do you attribute all your success to? And this artist, I was waiting there with bated breath. My wife and I were there on the couch, and I was like, yeah, they're going to give the glory to God. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. And the artist said, a lot of hard work and lucky breaks. And my heart sank. Because they attributed their success to their own ability. Shortly thereafter, this artist who was at the top fell off the mountain. And this artist has not had a single hit since that time. I remember when I came out of the hospital and everybody wanted to interview me. It was the weirdest thing. I come out and cameras are everywhere and phone calls and it didn't matter if it was the Fresno Bee in the front page or whether it was ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, Fox News, uh, not the national but the local channels, they all wanted to interview me and I was like, all I did was survive, all I did was live, that's okay. Well, I didn't realize at the time I was the one and only person who had come off the vent and went home in that particular hospital. And in many of the hospitals in the area, 
Look, the, the national average is this. 89% of the people that go on the ventilator don't make it off. And only 3% of those that go on the ventilator ever make it home as of right now. Most of them go into a long-term rehab facility. And by the way, I just want to say this. If you know somebody right now that's sick with COVID, there is a power and there is an, an, an anointing on my life to pray over that. And before we leave today, I'm going to pray over those. And I want you to call out their name. I want you to get on the chat. And I want you to put their names there. Because we're going to believe God and our intercessors are going to continue to believe God. And they're coming off the vent. I'm telling you, God can turn this around. We've had person after person after person. Not a single person that we have joined our faith together for and prayed for has not made it. They have supernaturally made it. There was one in Hanford that was the first to come off the vent and go home. And this church was praying. And there's an anointing on this. There were two young men back east, in, I believe it was in Virginia, that were given virtually no hope. And God turned them around and they walked out of the hospital and went home. But back to my point. When they wanted to interview me, I said on one condition. I get to tell and you get to report exactly what I say. You can't edit it. You can't take it out. You will say what I say. And you will not twist it. Agreed. And every single one of them, I gave glory to God. Glory, glory, glory. All glory goes to him and the prayers. I thank God for all the doctors. I thank God for all of the care that I received. And it was fantastic care and concern. And the doctors were in close contact with my wife every single day. But at the end of the day, the doctors could not help me. It was only the prayers of the saints. And God himself turned this thing around. And I raised up off of my deathbed and I'm here today. So I tell you this, God's not going to share his glory with anybody. Be careful that when the special strength comes, that you give glory to him and him alone. Why? Because he wants to associate you with his greatness. He wants, when your name is mentioned, it should be associated with God's greatness everywhere you go. And because he wants to turn all these hearts toward him. God gives strength, hope, and faith to complete the journey. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in the height of the civil rights movement, he wrote in one of his books, about the horrible time that he went through and he didn't think he could make it any longer. It was at the height of the movement. His popularity was everywhere. But along with the popularity came death threats. Came threats that you can't imagine to his children, to his wife, and to his own harm. We all know that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. But prior to all of that, there was a particular time when it was at its peak and it was a pivotal moment where the tide was just about to turn. In one particular time, he said, I felt so weak. I was so wiped out. I didn't want to go anymore. I actually was in my living room, and I had gotten a phone call that said, you're not wanted here. Your family's not wanted here. We're going to kill your children. We're going to kill your wife. We're going to kill you. He said threat after threat that kept coming no matter what. And he said, everywhere I turned, there was opposition. And he said, my strength was gone. I was weary in the journey, and I just wanted to quit. And he said, I started to pray. And he said, I felt a power of God and a strength of God for my assignment like I had never felt before. And he said, all of a sudden, I got up off that floor and I realized I had the hand of the Lord upon me. And there was a special strength for my journey. 
a special strength for, it was a supernatural strength for the assignment that I felt upon my life. And I'm here to tell you that God will give you that same supernatural strength. Maybe you say, well, my assignment isn't as big as his. Some of you don't even know what your assignment is. But I'm here to tell you that in the midst of this, God has given you special strength. So right here and right now where you're at, I want everybody, even there in your living rooms, I want you to bow your heads before the Lord. You know, God gave, I said this before, God gave Jesus special strength for the journey ahead when he paid the ultimate price on the cross for our provision. And maybe you're here today and you've never received Christ. Maybe you're watching today and you've never received Christ into your life. Right now, there where you're at, I'm going to pray with you and I believe the Lord is going to come in and strengthen you and transform you from the darkness of the world to the light of his love. Everything is about to shift. Some of you are needing that special strength, and I believe the hand of the Lord is coming into your living room and even right through your television right now or your computer right now or your phone, whatever it is, the power of God is about to come in and his hand is going to come upon you and he's going to give you special strength. I believe some of you are going to have angelic visitations Yes, I believe in angels. Just had one visit me a few months ago in the hospital. It's common practice in the Word of God. He'll send whatever means he needs to to give you strength. And there is a special strength coming your way. So if that's you today and you're watching and you're saying, Pastor Mark, I don't know the Lord. I've never received him into my life. I've never received that provision of the cross for my sin and Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, then right there where you're at, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and made the provision for me. And now I invite you into my life to take over and give me a whole new life and that special strength that's been spoken of today. Lord, turn my life around. I give it to you because I'm tired. I'm weary of running this life alone and I need you today. Come into my life. I give my life to you. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to get on the chat and tell somebody right now that you made that decision to follow Christ or you rededicated your life back to Christ. And, and I want those chats to begin to come through so that our, our prayer warriors can, can contact you and pray with you and agree with you. You, you, need to, you need to get into a community of believers. I know we're not able right now to meet together, but you can still be connected to a community of believers that will love you and walk you through this journey and run this race with you and alongside you. God bless you. We love you. I want to pray strength on each and every person that's watching today, a supernatural strength. If you're there in your living room, I know this feels weird, but nobody else is watching. You just reach out your hands towards that television, and I believe right now that special strength is coming your way. When you walk into the room, Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. So Lord, walk into the rooms, walk into the living rooms and give them special strength for their journey. Special strength. Anita, I know you just lost your mama and I know you're struggling. And the Lord says, I'm giving you special strength right now. I'm giving you special strength right now. Strength that's coming your way. Father, I thank you that those that have lost jobs, special strength coming their way. Those that are feeling all the anxiety and the worry and the concern over all of this, special strength coming their way. Those that have been fear, fill, filled with fear over COVID, God, I thank you 
that you're removing the fear and replacing it with faith and the love of God because perfect love casts out all fear and giving them special strength today. Those that have been struggling right now and have gone back to old addictions and drinking and partying just to numb the pain. God, I thank you that they have not found any solutions in that. And right now you're coming in with supernatural strength and breaking every addiction and breaking every stronghold that we would not run to those things any longer, but we would run to you. We would run to you. We would run to you. Father, we thank you for it. Right now, right now, right now, I pray for these that need healing from COVID-19. Evelyn Rivera. I thank you, Father God, for healing for her, for Virginia Hawkins right now, for Lynn right now, for Sandra Hernandez right now. Father, right now, right now, right now, uh, the Montagna uh, family and a few family members right now, right now, right now, an eight-month pregnant girl, God, right now in the name of Jesus, we break COVID off of her body. I command these bodies right now healing 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 to flow i curse covid to its root by the authority of heaven what you did in me god you are doing for these right now and i reverse that cursed disease and i command that virus go dissipate those cells will go and dissipate. I curse it to its root. I pluck it up right now and I command the life of God to flow through you. Breathe into those lungs. Fever, go. All the symptoms, go. All the symptoms, go. Those that are on respirators, I thank you, God, that you're coming in to the ICU unit right now and breathe, Holy Spirit, into their bodies. Oh, what doctors cannot do and no medicine is helping with, God, turn it around right now. Turn it around right now. Turn it around right now. Special strength and healing coming to those right now in Jesus' name. Father, I speak to Virginia Barkley. I command healing in her body right now. It's not from COVID, but other things that are plaguing her body. I command you, body, you will line up with the word of God right now and be healed and whole. Strength and life. Breathe life into you. And healing and wholeness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just feel God moving on people's lives right now. Healing power. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Don't forget Tuesday from 7 to 10. We're going to be praying. It's primarily for the ladies, but this is a time that you can join us. We'll be on all of our uh, various outlets, including Facebook that we were on today. And uh, I believe we're actually even going to be on YouTube. Is that right, Adam? We're going to be on YouTube. All of it is going to be out there for Tuesday evening. God is opening doors for us. No additional charge, and we're able to go to all these different venues. And uh, I just believe that the reach is going to continue to expand far beyond anything that these four walls ever confined us to. And we're looking forward to the day that we can all worship together again and be together but we can still stay connected even if we can't physically come together at this point. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you hopefully Tuesday night, and if not, for sure, next Sunday morning. God bless you. Have a great day.